Their forms are horrible, their heads square, all set with prickles and surrounded by long sharp horns like the roots of an upturned tree. These heads are 10 or 12 cubits long, very black, with huge globular eyes. The legends regarding the Kraken have always been frightening to people, but also very exciting. But let's try to remember who first started spreading these stories. Sailors. Stories about heroic battles with monsters in almost 100% of cases involved merchant ships. And coincidentally, somehow after meeting the Kraken, many sailors became fabulously rich. In this video, you'll find out what did the Kraken really look like? What legends regarding the Kraken are still told in the 21st century? And most importantly, we'll find the answer to the question, why did sailors invent the Kraken? In ancient times, sailing was predominantly coastal. Moving from island to island was generally undertaken only if the land was visible. But the big Dutch East India Trading Company, founded in 1602, made a real breakthrough. Maritime expeditions significantly expanded their routes, replacing the nearby seawaters with a boundless ocean. But that said, the Dutch East India Company was an amorphous organization with incidental and non-permanent membership. Often desperate blokes who fled from difficult lives and were looking for a new source of income ended up as sailors. Data on crew members, details on the ships, information about the goods, nothing was officially recorded anywhere and wasn't controlled by anyone. We used GPS navigators, our ships are equipped with high quality cameras, and indeed most ships can be tracked from a computer by anyone who's interested. But in the 16th century, there was none of that. The most advanced sailor's gadget was a regular old logbook. Because of this, in the case of missing goods, or even a whole ship, you just had to take much of a sailor's word for granted. The first officially recorded encounter with the Kraken dates back to November the 13th, 1861. The ship's commander, Lieutenant Frederick Marie Boyer, provided the public not only with a horrifying story of the sea monster that attacked his ship, but also exhibited the tip of the Kraken's tail as evidence. The commander explained that the rest of the Kraken's body went underwater due to its immense weight, and everybody believed him. Sailors' records from the ship's log from a vessel called the Celestina show that in 1810, they noticed an almost 70-meter glowing spot in the water. Despite such a vague description, they were sure it was the Kraken. The sailors told tales of that encounter with the sea monster, each time supplementing its description with a constantly growing number of incredible new details. In fact, according to all the differing stories regarding that encounter with the sea demon, it turns out it was 9 meters long, or 20, or even 40. It's almost as if it were some kind of split kraken with multiple personalities. A year later, on a voyage from Valparaiso to the American shores, an English vessel was almost lost after ramming, yes, the kraken itself. According to the crew members, one night they saw something rising up from a few fathoms below them, and it was something like a living island it was so large. The sailors said the ship crashed full steam into it, slicing through it, the ship shredding the monster, with the remnants of the Kraken sinking, disappearing back into the depths. Quite possibly, these sailors also told tales of a fight with a cyclops they stabbed with a fork. There were far more people willing to listen to tales of a run-in with the Kraken than those who craved to hear all about the six months you got seasick while weathering storms while you were scrubbing the deck. P. 
people were much more interested in hearing from the sailors about all the fantastic adventures they'd been on as they sailed halfway around the world. And those who never left their homeland were ready to believe every single word of any sailor's tale. One could hear sailors telling stories about not only krakens, but also about hydras and sirens and other mythical beasts. And not only hear, but see as well. For example, this mermaid skeleton was a very rare and extraordinary exhibit. People paid big money to see the mermaid with their own eyes, and some even rented it for twelve and a half dollars a week, which was a lot back then. But alas, this skeleton, in reality, had simply been hacked together from a monkey torso and a big fish tail. As you can see, the ingenuity of some of these sailors had no limits. And some people were willing to give every last dime they had for a piece of this Kraken's tentacle. But this wasn't the only way sailors made money on the Kraken. How was the Kraken helping these scheming sailors? There was no formal requirement to register the loss of vessels until as late as 1786. But when the mysterious disappearances became more frequent, it became necessary to think about an accounting system. Indeed, the primary victims were merchant ships carrying valuable cargo, and that had to be reported back to unhappy customers. But sailors who were masters at storytelling easily managed to sidestep even these formalities. The Kraken was originally part of a much earlier Scandinavian and Icelandic folklore, but it enjoyed particular popularity during the explosive development and expansion of the shipping trade. In 1872, a merchant brigantine called Mary Celeste, with its entire crew and almost 2,000 barrels of denatured alcohol that were being shipped from New York to Italy, disappeared. Later, the vessel was found drifting, crewless, with not a single soul left aboard. Some claimed that the Mary Celeste had been hijacked by the crew of a brig named the De Gratia. The list of things that were missing from the ship aroused suspicion. A lifeboat, a navigational tool called a sextant, and the captain's personal chronometer. While all personal belongings, the precious cargo, and the food supplies remained intact. The sailors who had discovered the lost ship stated that they'd just came across it by chance, finding it abandoned, and eventually sued the owner of the brigantine for a reward. But it actually turned out that the captains of the De Gratia and the Mary Celeste were old friends. Most likely, they conspired to receive an insurance payment and deliberately staged the disappearance charade. As you can see, it had become quite easy to uncover such frauds and identify likely culprits. It therefore became necessary for these wannabe swindlers to begin to think differently. Like accusing someone whose detection is not only frightening, but also impossible. For example, a giant squid with mystical powers. And when sailors shipped goods with considerable delay, or even strayed off course and fled into unknown directions along with the cargo, they eventually blamed it all on the Kraken. They attributed all of these unfortunate occurrences to the fact that the giant marine devil creature confounded their minds. It also somehow mesmerized ship's cartographers, as they often mistook the creature for an island and could never find it a second time. By and large, the Kraken was to blame. But let's get our heads around some real-life stories about a sea demon and find out, is it the Kraken who's the guilty party? One day, Musa I, the richest man in history, set out on an expedition to the Atlantic Ocean. His fleet consisted of 2,000 ships carrying thousands of men, women, slaves, and of course, a lot of baggage, gear, cargo, and supplies that was worth a fortune. But 
not a single solitary human being ever returned from the expedition, not a single ship. How is this possible? There were legends that the Kraken killed them all. Musa had left behind many problems when he'd embarked on this grand voyage. He'd been so rich that his generous almsgiving had virtually destroyed the economy of the state of Mali, and all of his efforts had apparently been destroyed by huge tentacles. There were cases when this maniacal kraken beast was blamed for economic disaster. The ship, the SS Central America, was carrying a cargo valued at $150 million, with that cargo being 15 tons of pure gold. Nobody knows the exact cause of the wreck, but folklore added that tragedy to the tab of the insatiable monster, the Kraken. Either way, in 1857, that incident resulted in the first global economic crisis. The greatest marine casualties cover a period when the East India Trading Company was in full swing. Apart from those ships that were supposed to remain overseas, less than 94% returned home. That's quite suspicious. Perhaps out in the deep waters and sea lanes the merchant ships traversed, there really was a dreadful, colossal monster waiting for them. But, in fact, there are more logical explanations for all of these odd occurrences. After Musa disappeared, his brother Mali inherited the lush and prosperous kingdom. It's quite possible the whole thing was planned, a well-thought-out plot of assassination for gain. Or maybe Musa himself just sailed away from all the problems he'd created back home and set off to chill out on some island somewhere with all his pals, attendants, and so forth. The SS Central America investors could have run a similar scam as the owners of the Mary Celeste. And as for the East India vessels, 39 of them were wrecked or lost, 7 of them were burned, and 12 of them were captured. Most of them were carrying Asian luxury goods such as porcelain tableware, expensive tea, rare fabrics, and most importantly, spices. Before spices were brought to England, food really was tasteless. That's why spices at that time were even more valuable than gold by weight. Obviously, those ships were a mouth-watering prize for thieves. But sailors were not quick to talk about their defeats in battle against some seafaring outlaws. On the contrary, how much more noble it sounds to die fighting the mythical Kraken. And so, in the folklore of the English and the French, the Kraken giant octopus appeared at just the same time. When news of further missing ships broke in France, a French naturalist by the name of Pierre Denis de Montfort suggested that the ships had been sunk by giant squids, namely the Kraken. But in fact, as they sailed to the coast of the West Indies, the French ships had really been captured by the English. Out of six ships of captives and four English ships, not a single one ever returned. When the British Admiralty learned the truth about what had transpired, there was such a scandal that the French naturalist had to give up his scientific career. And so began the long acquaintance with sailors' fantasies and the Kraken. For many years, this creature was a smokescreen for cunning sailors. But the big question mark hanging over all of this whole sordid affair relates not to them, but to all the people who believed them. As I mentioned earlier, these days, thanks to the clever exploitation of modern technology, such occurrences must surely have been fully eliminated, as the fables of any sailor can be verified. Or can they? What legends regarding the Kraken are told by contemporary sailors in this 21st century? Before judging those who, in the past, believed those terrifying tales of the Kraken, we need to first look at ourselves. 
I think everyone has at least one story of true anger concerning a failed delivery of an order from a web store. It would seem that with the help of modern technology, the process of shipping should be more than perfectly well established nowadays. But let's follow the trend of container losses from modern cargo ships. Losses have increased quite substantially over the past seven years. In fact, more than a thousand of these huge boxy receptacles went missing on the high seas in 2020, and over a thousand boxes have fallen overboard in 2021. Such accidents disrupt supply chains for hundreds of American retailers and manufacturers such as Amazon and Tesla. This includes containers carrying everything from car tires to smartphones. There's no way to verify whether this was due to a storm, a slippery deck, or any other reason for that matter. But one thing is for sure, it's no longer acceptable to blame the Kraken. You know what though? Two years ago, in US waters, researchers captured an image of a very strange creature on a specially designed deep-sea camera system called the Medusa. And this creature was an unusually large squid. And then something truly mysterious and almost supernatural transpired. The ship's metal hull was suddenly struck by lightning, putting the data on the scientists' computers for this invaluable survey at risk. Fortunately, everything turned out okay. But all this devilment leads me to believe that it might have been no ordinary squid. Perhaps these shots could serve as video evidence that the Kraken has returned. But I was thinking, even if the Kraken decided to steal something, like a container chock full of iPhones, it still couldn't use more than eight of them, as it doesn't have enough tentacles to hold any more. But I digress. So. The Kraken, real or not, became a savior of sailors who used the monster as justification for the loss of cargo. Actually, the phrase, I encountered the Kraken, could be used whenever one loses something. It was Krakened, for example. It wasn't me who stole that stapler from work. It must have been Krakened. Write in the comments what you may have happened to Kraken without ever feeling sorry about it. Or tell us about some internet purchase that failed to be delivered because it was likely Kraken by some wicked porch pirate or maybe even by the Kraken himself. Until next time.